Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, my talk, I'm Niklas Sarakari, uh, and my talk is about phishing, uh, especially through email, so no physical, physical phishing stuff or phone calling and such. So who am I? Well, I'm Niklas Sarakari. I do security stuff at Silverskin. And basically, what I like to do is breaking stuff, watching movies, and drink a lot of coffee. So that's what I usually do. Uh, well, why phishing and why, why especially email? Well, I'm generally interested in phishing, and also I'm doing my master's thesis about it. And I'm very interested about why people click phishing links, like what usually works and what doesn't work, and what protections are there that organizations and companies can implement, and also how these can be bypassed or abused to bypass uh, specific uh, protection mechanisms, like spam filtering and so on. So what is phishing? Well, basically, it is a practice of sending uh, emails that appears to be coming from a legitimate source. And basically, the, the main goal is to gain influence against the target to retrieve sensitive data, personal identifiable information, passwords, gain access to the internal network, for example. It can contain uh, links to malicious sites, which being, has some clo cloned login sites that can be tried to trick the user to actually use its own company credentials to log into the site, for example, or malicious attachments that uh, do some sort of code execution on the workstation itself, and thus way opens an outbound or inbound connection to the attacker. <coughs> well, why people uh, click phishing links? Well, there was an actually in 2016 uh, talk in Black Hat. Uh, there was a, a university in Germany where they actually conducted an experiment to see how people actually and why people click on these sort of phishing links. And basically, the experiment was done for 1,200 students in the university. And what it contained was a non-existing link to a photograph that contained photographs of a party that never actually existed. And it came from a non-existing person. And what they did, they used a very common German name like some Bauer uh, as a last name or something like that. And the results were kind of interesting because, well, 34% 34, 34 of the recipients actually clicked the links only because of out of curiosity. So they were just interested to see what will be behind that, behind that link. Uh, almost 30% of the message uh, in, in, uh, included about the expectations that they were expecting something similar. So that was one of the reasons also why they actually went to the, went to the uh, malicious site that they uh, received in their email. Uh, and also 16%, uh, less than 20%, uh, thought that they might know the sender. So this was very uh, good way to actually gain uh, people's trust because they used very common names. For example, in Finland, it could be like Korhonen or Nieminen or something like that, very common. And in, in phishing, especially if people are interested to doing phishing, uh, basically you have to have a, well, uh, a reason for it and also permission. And what I've encountered is that it is very important to also cover your ass legally. So basically, when doing social engineering engagements and phishing, uh, we basically are interacting with real people, and real people usually get really easily offended also. <coughs> and also, uh, we have access to sensitive data, usually like credentials. There are some privacy issues. For example, I've encountered cases with, uh, with some customers that they asked us to provide their data about the users, uh, like their names, that who had actually clicked these uh, phishing links that we were sending to the people. So thank thankfully, there is a, uh, the Personal Data Act in Finland actually gives uh, quite good protection against for the users that we have to, when doing phishing, there is due diligence that we have to do that we cannot actually provide any, any real data that could be used against those uh, users that actually click the link. So only data that you can provide is basically an an anonymized, so they cannot be used against people. Uh, then uh, some protection mechanisms and how to actually bypass them. This is basically what I've learned during these couple of years that I've been doing phishing. <clears throat> the first one is the sender policy framework, uh, SPF. So it's basically a simple email validation system that basically when you're sending email and if you have SPF configured, the receiving mail server will check that if the actual IP or domain is actually allowed to send uh, emails to this address or looking that coming from that address. So basically, if you have SPF configured properly, then it will actually give you this sort of uh, information, for example, 
that the sender has failed the fraud detection. This is from Outlook. And this is uh, one of the very common methods that have been used for CEO phishing, for example, sending or trying to trick money out of organizations. Uh, the deplo deployment varies quite a lot uh, worldwide and also in Finland. Uh, there was a Detectify made a research about this a couple of, year, couple of years back, and they found that uh, almost 50% in top Alexa 500 sites actually had misconfigured SPF records. So basically, you could present yourself as that organization sending emails to other uh, to the people in that organization, for example. Uh, there was also uh, done uh, last autumn, uh, Suomen Kuvalehti did an article about SPF in Finland where they actually send emails to, uh, to ministers in the, in the Finnish parliament acting as super or policy and that they would actually could trick these ministers to give out sensitive data or somehow gain even access to their computers if you would actually send uh, malicious attachments within those emails. Uh, so this, uh, I made a little uh, proof of concept script that you can actually give uh, domains and then it will run through their DNS text records to check whether they have SPF records actually configured or not. And this is also very important when doing uh, phishing and when you're targeting some organization, it's always very, uh, let's say, uh, important to always check that the SPF records are actually configured. So if they are not, then you can actually basically look like you're also that the email that you're sending as a phishing can actually come from that organization, so it's really hard to detect in that way. Uh, the other one, uh, domain keys identified mail or DKM, uh, basically uh, together with SPF and DMARC, this is also an email authentication validation uh, mechanism. And basic, the basic idea with this is that it basically just adds uh, cryptographic signatures into the email headers and provides uh, mechanisms to actually validate that no one has actually tampered with that email du during transit. Uh, then there's DMARC, or Domain Message Authentication Reporting and Conformance. And this actually takes uh, the both DKM and SPF records and gives you like a policy to actually you can get, gain information from your MTA, let's say Gmail or Outlook or whatever, or your own. It will send you reports if, some, if someone is trying to abuse. Uh, you can find find if someone is trying to abuse your abuse your MTAs or trying to send email uh, on your behalf or uh, try, dying to trying to actually look like it's coming from your from your domain. So basically, how SPF and DKM can be used as an attacker or bypass protections? Well, basically, many let's say email security services and providers like Proofpoint or Defense and so on, they will actually check that if you have SPF and DKM records, you're actually more reputable and more legitimate than if you don't have these. So basically, if you just, as an attacker, buy yourself a domain name, uh, configure SPF and DKM records, then when you add these to their emails, then the email security service, when it, when it receives that email, it will check, oh, you have this, all these headers, so it looks legitimate and it's more reputable than if you would have this, because they are sort of protection mechanisms, and these are one of the stuff that they, that they especially Proofpoint detects. And uh, I figured this out uh, like a year, a year and a half ago. I was trying to uh, send uh, phishing emails to a client, and all of them ended up in spam or were filtered. And then I was thinking about, well, what would be the reason behind it? And then, uh, then I found out that yeah, if I would actually configure these SPF and DKM records and then try to send the email again, then it was actually bypassed all the protection mechanisms they actually had. Uh, then there is also uh, filtering. Uh, there's malware filtering, spam filtering, and URL whitelisting, and so on. And especially with malware filtering, it tries to, it tries to actually block uh, any malicious attachments, like if you would have PDF, Excel, or Word documents, or et cetera. So that is something that it tries to uh, prevent that the attacker's uh, payload would actually reach its intended target. And there was a, there was a uh, last year, this uh, DDE, DDE attack vector, dynamic data exchange, which basically allows you to use Word documents functionality to actually send data between applications. So we could, for example, use Word document to send data to a PowerShell or to a command prompt and try to gain code execution. 
Uh, nowadays, uh, most of the AV stuff, uh, they detect the DDE, but there are several different obfuscation methods that you can use to actually bypass this protection. So it's not, it doesn't actually provide 100% protection. So this is a very good method to also gain uh, access to the target's workstation through phishing. And with DDE, it's also good because it doesn't require macros to be enabled, so it doesn't rely on macros. But what it does, it of course, the victim has to click a few of these pop-up messages and actually accept that you, he, he will actually execute that code and the data will be changed between the applications. And also, the first problem with DDE was that at first, uh, it will show you at the actual payload code or the code, malicious code that you will, you will use in the payload. And someone figured it out that you can actually somehow also obfuscate that, and you can actually hide the real payload using, uh, uh, using some techniques and methods to actually give it some more legitimate uh, warning example, like this is a secure document or something like that. Uh, with uh, URL whitelisting and web filtering, with that, uh, basically what the organization or the IT infrastructure can do is that it can, may only allow specific domains to be accessed through the internal network, for example. That is a very effective uh, way to actually protect uh, the internal network to having users accessing malicious sites. So example, Proofpoint and I think also Defense and others uh, provide this uh, feature. But for example, I think Proofpoint now, Proofpoint actually now merged with uh, Palo Alto and actually Palo Alto has a feature in their, web, in their website that you can actually request to change a site from a blacklist or from an unknown site to actually a more legitimate site. So you can give them your domain, and it will actually go there. I don't know if it's automated or not, but it will go there. And if you have some legitimate stuff over there, it will actually basically whitelist it in their, in their database. So depending on whether the uh, target organization is using their own whitelist or the one provided by the Proofpoint or Palo Alto can be used to also bypass this, this method. I tested it, and it actually works. Uh, then there is gray listing. Uh, gray listing is more an uh, anti-spam feature or a mechanism that was developed also some time ago, but it's only effective to actually prevent some, some poor, uh, poor spams like you, you have like Viagra messages or love letters and stuff. So basically what gray listing does is uh, the MTA, if, if the MTA receives email from an unknown source, it will actually block it and wait for, wait for the email account to retransmit the message. So what spammers usually doesn't do is that, that they, either they don't use valid, valid uh, email servers, et cetera, but they will just move on to the next one. So if the email actually doesn't reach its target or they don't care, they will just move on to the next target and next target and the next target. But if you want to do targeted phishing and sending emails, then basically what you can do is just implement, a, let's say, set up postfix server and send that email. And if, if you hit uh, to a gray listing, great. Uh -huh. To a gray listing uh, protection mechanism, then basically what it does, it, it will try to retransmit the message all the time. And if the gray listing notices that, yeah, it's been trying to retransmit the message, let's say the last four hours, then it did usually allow it through. And basically what the gray listing does is it's, it also has some negative sides because basically if you are receiving valid email, from a, from a person that hasn't been sending you emails before from an unknown source, then it, that will be also blocked. So it also might have negative consequences. For example, it, if it's some, some sort of business email that is very crucial to be received within a short period of time, then if it's being blocked by gray listing, then what can you do? Uh, then there is site cloning. Uh, website cloning is more of you're doing very targeted and trying to actually harvest credentials, for example. And uh, there are uh, readily available tools that can be used to, to clone sites, like VGET or Social Engineering Toolkit, for example, provides tools for this. Or you can also build it by, build it by yourself if you want. And also, what I've noticed with, uh, when sending uh, phishing emails to targets and, and so on, and basically, if you, if you include it with an IP address, it will usually will get blocked. So always use fully qualified domain names. Because if it's an IP, it always looks more suspicious to the, to the, let's say, email security service. And they're using some machine learning algorithms that they say that will actually notice that. And then 
flag it as uh, suspicious or malicious and will not allow it true. And of course, other good option is to always use HTTPS. So using encrypted traffic and less encrypt is very good for this because it's free and it allows you like 90, 90 days of uh, certificates that can be used to secure the SSL traffic. And then there is, I don't know if you heard about this ID and homograph attack. But basically what this is that you can use Punicode to register domains with foreign, foreign characters. So basically you can use Cyrillic alphabets or, or Finnish uh, and so on. And what this does is basically the Unicode ch characters are very hard to distinguish from the real ones. So if you see a Cyrillic A and a, and a Latin A, you cannot basically detect the difference between those two. And uh, this issue was fixed in Chrome last year, but it is still uh, available in Firefox because Firefox doesn't think it's, it's their problem. It's more of the domain, domain uh, provider's issue. So you can configure it and fix it in, in Firefox by configuring the, uh, disabling the Punicode and so on. And basically, this is the example of what it looks like. So I have a, let's say I have a domain named gmail.com that I bought with the Punicode with the Punicode technique, and then you can see what it looks like in Firefox and what it looks like in Chrome. So in the Firefox version, for example, if I will send an email, email to the target, sending it, you have to log into your Gmail, so you have two-factor authentication enabled. So it's very hard to distinguish, actually, if, if this is an uh, illegitimate site or actually a real Gmail account or Gmail site, for example. So what usually works in phishing? Well, what, I, what I've noticed is the one that I usually use in every one of the, every campus that I, we use for our uh, customers is that package delivery messages actually are very good to actually have people clicking malicious links or opening attachments. And it doesn't even have to come from a valid or legitimate source. It, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to spoof yourself to be like post the hold the UPS DHL or anything. You can just, you can just invent a name for a company that has some, somehow has a feel and look that it is actually delivering uh, post or packet, packages. And also, other good one is, let's say, you're sending email from uh, saying that you're from the service desk or the IT department works very well, and other reputable sources like LinkedIn, Gmail, Dropbox, you name it. And also, a good uh, attack vector in this one is looking for something that is currently relevant to the company. Maybe it's, they have an IPO some sort of marketing campaign going on, Christmas parties, summer parties, whatever, can be also used to lure, lure the targets to click the links and open the stuff. So this is something that we've been using. So basically, it says, yeah, you have a, you have, your package has been, or your order has been dispatched, and this is your tracking number, and here's the tracking link, you can follow the package, and so on. And until this day, in the campaign, we've had 340 targets. And from these targets, uh, almost a third of them open at the email. We're also tracking who opens the email. And from these 130 people, uh, usually 43 clicks the link also. And what I've also noticed is that I use like a no reply at, at the finpost.com, for example. And many of these who receive this email are actually sending emails back to me. Who's like, what is this package? I haven't ordered anything. Can you please call me? And this is my phone number. This is my home address. Uh, it, it is my birthday. Uh, it, it's basically, as I said before in the Black Hat, where they found that 34% of curiosity rate. So this is basically something that actually pokes that specific issue on people is that fear or curiosity. So people might be scared that, I, have I actually ordered something but I forgot? Or has someone ordered something for me? Or has someone actually abusing my names or my data to actually sending uh, data? And uh, this is from a 2013 Verizon data breach investigation report. Uh, I like the name because it's the inevitability of the click. Uh, what this is that uh, they did a research about, about how easily or how many emails you basically have to send to get someone to click that phishing link. And basically, if you send, uh, uh, let's say, three emails, and you have three targets, and basically you have a 50% success rate to actually someone clicking that uh, malicious link in that email. And let's say if you double it, you have let's say six emails, then it's almost over 80%. And if you let's say send 10 or more, then it's almost guaranteed that someone from those recipients will actually open that specific email. 
So simply clicking the link is usually not enough. It doesn't actually say, let's say, if you click a link, it doesn't basically breach your network or your target machine. It requires additional steps like downloading stuff or provide, you have to provide your credentials and so on. So basically, what else you can do is, well, your password has been leaked, and please go reset your password to our organization's uh, password recovery site. Uh, sorry, this is in Finnish, because the target organization was in Finnish, was in Finland, and so on. But basically, what you can do is uh, send this very urgent message with bad Finnish, actually, if you look at here, is that, well, we have discovered in our IT department that your password has been leaked somewhere, and please go and reset your password in, that, in our reset site. So what we did is buying a similar looking domain, uh, use HTTPS, clone, the, clone their own recovery, password recovery site or reset, reset site, and sending this sort of email to them. So let's say we had uh, almost 200 targets, and from these, uh, 30% uh, actually opened the site, and this is, this is quite mind-boggling. 52 of them actually submitted their credentials into that site. So that is pretty bad to just having a, your uh, recovery site publicly available, and pretty one, a, everyone with good, good enough Finnish language can actually abuse that feature. Uh, the third uh, example that I have, we had a customer, they had this uh, SharePoint-like service where you can uh, share, uh, upload and download documents and share them between employees in that organization. So reconnaissance is also a very important step when doing phishing because you, you actually have to collect information that you can actually make it look as legitimate as possible to gain that uh, target's trust to that, and you can trick him to actually click those links, uh, opening those attachments and giving out their credentials, for example. So they had this uh, site, uh, public internet available. Yeah, that's fine. And the login is done to, with AD credentials, Active Directory. And uh, the objective for this one was to actually op uh, steal the credentials of the specific targets that we had there, or a little less than 30 of them. Well, luckily, we, we did some reconnaissance about this service. And using Google, we actually found a specific guide about that uh, site. Uh, how you can actually upload and download uh, files, how you can actually share them between users. And then also the, the guide also included an example, what does the email actually looks like when, when you're sharing a file to someone else in your company. So it basically, just a little bit of Googling actually did all the job for us. And we could actually go to the Next step, as in similar, uh, buying a very similar looking domain, let's say it has some xxxxxcom.net, so you just buy xxxxxcarn.net. It looks, uh, looks almost the same. You're looking at the URL feed, it's basically pretty hard to actually detect which one is, if it's fake or not. Uh, also, we copied the email content, uh, uh, send, uh, send it with it, its uh, the target's uh, first name or email address or whatever it was uh, the example and send the email that someone has shared a file with you, so please please click this link and log into this site. So from the results, we had 29 targets. Uh, from those uh, 12, click the link that we included in that, in that email, and from those 12, uh, seven people actually submitted uh, their credentials. So this is uh, uh, basically pretty easy easy to do against uh, companies and organizations and users to actually trick them, trick them to be clicking malicious links and sites and opening attachments if you can just make it look more, real enough and actually using very simple techniques and abusing uh, email authentication mechanisms to make it look your sources more reputable. So basically uh, what you can do, well, please implement SPF, DKM, and Daymark. Uh, in your in your IT infrastructure, because it basically allows uh, basically blocks someone else to be spoofing emails in your dom organization or by your domain, and uh, keep your domain safe. So I don't know if people remember that uh, Ira Ustala was in Twitter. Uh, he was buying domains in his own money 
to that looked pretty similar, let's say Valvira or Iltalehti and so on, that these also can be used if you just, if its domain is available, just buy it and you can use it in a, in a phishing campaign. So having actually, actually owning a lot of uh, similar looking domains can actually protect you quite, quite easily against this sort of attack. And also educate and train your users. So basically having, also, of course, awareness programs and so on, and doing uh, continu continuous uh, phishing, phishing campaigns and assessments to actually check that people actually understand and detect and how they actually report if they notice phishing. And this stuff can be actually protected against. And also securing your infrastructure, updating your servers, uh, uh, workstations that no one can actually let's say, uh, pwn your email servers and so on, or your workstation using some readily available exploits, for example. Uh, there is uh, also what Xorts did. Uh, he did this uh, uh, small proof of concept for uh, phishing catcher. So basically what it does, it, it uh, actually pulls search streams, transpar uh, uh, certificate transpar transparency log to try to detect uh, some possible uh, looking at uh, suspicious domains that might be be used in phishing campaigns. For example, Amazon, iCloud, uh, Apple, you name it. And this is open source. Uh, you can modify it in your, for your own use. You can use your own domain names. So if you're a large organization, you can basically run this and give it, give, and it can alert you if someone is requesting uh, as a self certificates, for example, a domain that looks pretty similar to yours. Uh, actually, I went this quite quick, quite quickly, so sorry and thank you and email phishing is actually a kind of a big deal that you can actually gain access to a target organization. <laughs> Any questions? There is one. Do we have a microphone somewhere? Um, hi. So hi. is there any numbers on people who reported this to their IT? I mean, kind of you showed the numbers of people who clicked, the numbers of people who put credentials, but how many people recognized it's a phishing attack? Yeah, it reported? usually varies, but I'd say it's around maybe 10, 15 percent. Something like that. Usually, if someone detects it, they usually discuss in a group, in a small group, in a cafeteria somewhere. That did you also receive this email? Did you click that link? I clicked that link. So usually, it's very small numbers that actually report these uh, phishing campaigns. And it's actually also, I think, it's pretty bad because they don't report it because usually it just goes by unnoticed, and it can also take a while before someone actually, hey, someone is actually sending uh, phishing links to us, and it's, people are clicking this, but you cannot do anything about it because you don't know about it. So it's usually maybe 10, 15% what I've heard. So what you're saying is basically some people get a bit uh, worried about, but till it gets to IT, it's even less percentage from these people. So improving mm -hmm. the whatever report phishing methods might, might be kind of helpful for a company. Yeah. Basically, it is a very small number that usually report it to the IT itself. And uh, any more? No? Yep. Cheers. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I missed the first part of it, but uh, I'll, I'd like to ask if there is some correlation between the quality of language used and the actual effectiveness of the campaign. Can you put it uh, OK, sorry. Uh, is there any correlation between the quality of language used and the effectiveness of the campaign? Because uh, I see a lot of like uh, these really bad translation yeah well ba basically uh, especially in Finland it is that if you're sending uh, let's say phishing emails in English then usually the email security service can detect it that they have some sort of algorithms maybe they detect it that it is usually spam but if you use Finnish language it's basically very trivial to bypass everything and and well, be, people also mistype their emails so I usually leave always a little clues in the email like there was the tiatomme or something like little grammar errors that can help people to actually detect that it is phishing, but 
but uh, basically what usually doesn't work is saying that, yeah, if you answer this survey, you will get a $50 gift card to Amazon. That usually doesn't work or something like that. So it actually has to be very targeted, related to somehow to that person, pique its curiosity, like, yeah, you have a package or someone has made uh, an account on your name, something like this, that it actually makes the target to take interest to it somehow. And if it especially if it comes to your service desk, then it's also, I mean, we had an example some time ago that uh, one of our customers had an internet uh, login site, and it was protected by two-factor authentication. So what we, what we were doing that we were sending an email as uh, spoofing to be the service desk, and we said that, yeah, we have a new service which you can log in, uh, which you can access if you log into the internet site, and this is the link here. So it was cloned site as always, and uh, it had two-factor authentication, so what we did is that we were able to learn how the usernames are actually made, so we can just call the service desk, and actually what we were able to do is we were able to change people's phone numbers, just saying, my name is this person, this is my username. That way, you're going to basically access the whole internet services through that way, so. In Finland, phishing is actually pretty easy if you use Finnish language. People pretty easily go to this stuff. But it's also kind of, let's say, they go too easily for it, but it's also almost impossible for you as a normal user to somehow tackle against people. If someone's trying to fish you, you will most likely go for it. Uh, probably I have also gone to it, and pretty much, I think most of you have some, at some point went for a phishing link. So it's basically, I will always win in a phishing, phishing campaign. Someone will always click, as the, also the statistics show, show it. So. There is basically nothing you can, as a normal user, do, do except that always be skept skeptic about what you receive. If you don't know the person or it, it looks somehow fishy, then always I, I will not suggest to click it unless you can actually know that it is legitimate. Any more? Well, if not, then uh, thank you. And goodbye.